why don't we why don't we kick right into public participation so our guests don't have to wait any longer and um, we'll go from there so I'm calling the meeting back to order and good things how are you um, I probably have to do this more officially right for a moment good enough the time is now 122 quorum of the board is present state board of ed meeting of September 14th is in order um, why don't we skip the minutes and all that yep. and go right to public participation. Okay. We are, uh, our first speaker today is Dr. Judy Pritchett, representing uh, Macomb County Association of Superintendents and Macomb Association of Curriculum Administrators. And while she's coming <laughs> to the table, I'll remind you that uh, five minutes. Yes. And uh, there's no debate between board members and the public. Yep. Yes, I do. I'm sending it down both sides. I've actually read it. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I also have a handout on behalf of my colleagues at Oakland Schools. So that is also the one I can tell you. That's from Oakland Schools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. Oakland, coming. Yeah, Oakland. All right, thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak with you this afternoon. On behalf of the Macomb County Association of Superintendents and the Macomb County Association of Curriculum Administrators, this position paper has been reviewed by both of those groups and approved unanimously by each one of them. In March 2009, the Macomb County Superintendents and Curriculum Administrators submitted comments and questions to the State Board of Education and Michigan Department of Education on the initial proposal, <coughs> my SAS, to revise the state's accreditation system known as Education Yes. As explained in Mr. Flanagan's cover memo, the latest proposal, my SAS, is intended to align the my SAS accreditation system with both the new federal guidelines and accountability measures and the recently enacted state reform legislation primarily if they apply to persistently low performing schools. However, there are still issues unresolved from the initial my SAS proposal that are further confused by the new legislation that we ask you to consider before adoption. Issue number one, Michigan Law 380.1280 specifically <coughs> states that the standards for, accredi for accreditation, quote, shall not be based solely on pupil performance on MEEP tests or Michigan merit examination, unquote. Therefore, the only way for a school to become accredited is to meet performance proficiency levels on MEEP and MME, which is in direct violation of this statute. Accreditation as proposed by MySAS is determined strictly by test performance. The dashboard components are informative and address necessary compliance issues, but are not included in establishing accreditation levels only as a mechanism for lowering or losing accreditation over a two-year period. Additionally, when examining the chart on page four of this document, it should be noted that there are two ways to be accredited both based on pupil performance on MEEP and MME, but six ways to be interim or unaccredited without even taking into account the Michigan statute issues of certification and those others um, um, not uh, noted in the compliance part. Suggestions for improvement. With Michigan's improved data collection system existing and in progress, we believe other variables can be quantified and should be included in determining accreditation. These variables could include the following. Percent of students participating in extracurricular activities, level of parental involvement, opportunities to earn college credit while completing the diploma, AP, IB, early college, dual enrollment. Support programs available to students who are struggling to meet the standards, ease of access, college readiness as reported by the ACT percent of staff participation in professional development, and dual accreditation with other organizations such as Advanced Ed, Baldwin, Coalition of Essential Schools. 
This information would be of great value to the consumers, our parents, and the business community alike as it paints a more complete, clear picture of the school. Issue number two, as strongly as you support the inclusion of AYP into the formula for determining accreditation, we are equally uh, opposed to it. We unanimously support the position of MASA and MAISA on the upcoming reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act regarding AYP. That is found in Appendix A of this document. I am only going to um, uh, report out to you one important sentence. Quote, we also believe ESEA should develop a way to distinguish between schools that miss one or two benchmarks as compared to schools that miss multiple targets. In the department's My SAS proposal, it is stated, in addition to policy changes, educators, parents, and employers have identified concerns with the system and made numerous recommendations to make it more understandable and transparent. We then give an example of two um, uh, high schools uh, in one of the counties uh, who would be interim accredited because they did not attain AYP this year. Um, <coughs> along with that, uh, the interim accreditation label would also be attached to those schools between 6 and 20 percent on the low to high list. We give you suggestions for improvement on that. Um, and we also ask you under issue three to consider some questions for further discussion at the board level. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Our next speaker is Robert Peterson um, here to t from, let's see, from Troy here to talk about statistics education K-12. And actually there's three Are of us. Are you all going to come to the table together? Yes. The, uh, Dr. David Flaherty from Farmington Hills. Kathleen Peterson, also from Troy. Now, do we each get five minutes? No. Yeah, well. Is that the way it goes? <laughs> yeah, no. Otherwise, I, I can go home. <laughs> okay. These folders are supplementary material. <clears throat> My name is Bob Peterson. I'm currently serving as education co-chairperson for the American Statistical Association, the Detroit chapter. By the way, congratulations on being the first state to adopt the Common Core curriculum. <laughs> we are here for three reasons. First, to discuss possible enhancements to the statistics component of the Common Core curriculum. These enhancements will better prepare students for the workplace, cause students to better understand our data-driven society, so that they can make informed decisions as individuals and citizens to witness what you saw this morning. Prepare students to live smart in a world that is inherently complex. The second reason we're here is to recommend that there be at least a semester course in statistics as a requirement for graduation for all Michigan students. The third reason we are here is to discuss ways the American Statistical Association can assist in promoting statistic education in Michigan. I'd like to just talk a little bit about my colleagues. Dr. Kathy Peterson has taught statistics at the high school, undergraduate, and graduate level. She was the primary author of a semester course, Statistics for Everyone, which was developed under a Michigan Department of Education grant, and I thank you for that and has been taught in a number of schools, districts, in Macomb County. <coughs> that course was based on her experiences working with engineering data analysis course at the Ford Motor Company. Both Kathy and I are education co-chairpersons for the Detroit chapter of the ASA and are on the board of the Detroit Area Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Dr. David Fluharty is Manager of Marketing Forecasting and Research at Arvin Meritor Corporation. He has trained people in statistical problem solving in Michigan, Mexico, Poland, and Korea. David has had a long-term interest in promoting statistics education for the K-12 population, volunteering as a speaker at conferences and in classrooms. And he was on the item selection committee for the test on probability and statistics course of the Michigan Merit Curriculum. 
I have been in education for 45 years. My last two decades were as math consultant for the McComb Intermediate School District where I serve as 21 school districts. Kathy's and my involvement in developing items for the test of, for probability and statistics course of the Michigan Merit Curriculum caused us to become interested in the direction the State Board of Education is planning for statistical education. During my 20-year tenure at Macomb Intermediate School District, I spent time collaborating with industry to share in the development of a statistically-minded workforce. During that time, I learned two important things, that statistics was important in the workplace. Second one was the way they went about developing things. They used what they called the 2080 principle. Let's identify 20% of the material that's used 80% of the time, i.e., let's focus on the vital few versus the trivial many. <laughs> David? Okay. <coughs> you can have the rest of my time. Okay. <laughs> uh, perfect, that <laughs> and here, here's my talk. Okay. Uh, Bob's uh, too modest to tell you this, but in 1985, he received a Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics Teaching from President Reagan. Um, again, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to offer three questions for your consideration regarding uh, statistics for success in the workplace. Uh, the first question... This is a test. I'm in trouble. <laughs> 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 They're rhetorical questions. I read the rules. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in developing Michigan's curriculum, would it be wise to benchmark the essential statistical tools that Michigan's businesses are using from the shop floor, and I'm talking about you know, the shop floor, mm -hmm. to the boardroom and from the administrative office to the laboratory? And I'm going to cite a few examples. Uh, biostatistics is used in biotech firms, which are important to the future of the state. Econometrics in forecasting. Statistical sampling and polling, which I understand some of you may be involved in politics, so that may be. Uh, psychometrics, I think you have a few psychometricians on staff. Okay. Um, financial firms use statistical modeling uh, for everything from uh, portfolio selection to credit scoring. And as an aside, uh, given that even basic statistics or even basic finance involves a lot of statistics, you might consider a year-long course that combines financial and quantitative literacy together. Uh, I think it would motivate students and uh, that it'd be a way to implement the common core statistics and probability, and it might have strong support in the legislature and among the public. Uh, in my own work, I use a number of uh, tools of what's called competitive analytics, and I'll leave this book for you guys to circulate, um, including statistical simulation to improve forecasts, regression, statistical sampling theory, time series graphs, box plots. Uh, at a prior employer, uh, I used uh, statistical models to help improve reliability of products and to estimate warranty costs. Um, but please, don't think that statistics is just for specialists. Um, Michigan's companies and organizations around the world are investing massively, and I, I underline massively, in training blue-collar, white-collar, and technical personnel in statistics, uh, often as part of Six Sigma programs, and I'll, again, I'll leave this book for uh, circulation. Uh, these include organizations like Ford, General Electric, Motorola, and the U.S. Army and Navy. Um, and again, these courses include not only uh, tools in the Common Core, but time series graphs, I stress that a lot, design of experiments, and statistical process control. Uh, at my own company, Arvin Meritor, using statistics to reduce variability and improve processes is one of the keys to our continued success. Uh, consequently, we have committed to certifying at least 1,500 of our 10,000 worldwide employees at some level of Six Sigma. And that takes between four days of training for the introductory level to uh, 
about 23 days spread over four months for the advanced level. Our firm, like many others, would like to see everyone who enters the workforce have at least a basic understanding of how statistical concepts and tools are used to solve business problems. Again, the core curriculum is a good foundation, but from a business perspective, what's missing, probably the, the glaring concept that's missing is variation. Mm -hmm. Variation is a fundamental aspect of every physical, biological, and social system, and consequently, statistical tools that are designed to deal with variation are essential if you want to understand those systems, including educational systems, and make changes to them. And without numbered expectations addressing variation and teachers who understand this, it's a profound concept, uh, students really won't understand it the why and the how of, of doing statistics. The third question is really an offer of help. Uh, would you think it would be useful to have a list of people in business and academics and K-12 educators who are familiar with how statistics can help in the classroom? We'd be glad to develop the list for you. The end. <laughs> Thank you. As Bob mentioned, we are happy to see the adoption of the Common Core curriculum. But the statistics and probability section is heavy on probability and we feel that there are additional topics in statistics that should be included. These topics are based on recommendations from industry and also on the needs of everyday citizens in our data driven world. Among these topics are a heavy emphasis on interpreting graphs. We tried to uh, keep track of how many graphs we saw here today. <laughs> we lost count. We lost count of how many times you said data here today. We didn't hear you say calculus once. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Statistical process control. Very important in the automobile industry and all kinds of industries. Design of experiments, including multi-factor experiments and interactions. Constant emphasis on, on the existence of variability, how to, measure it, how to measure it and how to make decisions in its presence. The importance of randomness and sample size. Understanding the design of polls and surveys and how that impacts their validity. We're, we're bombarded with this stuff every day in the paper. The central limit theorem, confidence intervals and margins of error. We would like to see a dedicated required course, possibly one combined with financial literacy. A dedicated course would most likely be taught by the teacher most qualified to teach it. Not all teachers have the background and the understanding at this point to teach statistics. And teachers who do not have sufficient background to teach statistics would probably skip that material in an integrated course. I mean, there's so much material, what are you going to skip? The stuff you're not familiar with, you know? Okay. And they may even teach it incorrectly, and we've seen this in some of our teacher training programs. That brings up another matter. As important as it is to strengthen the statistics curriculum, there's a great need to train math teachers to teach statistics. Responding to this need has an adva added advantage to Michigan education. A bill is currently being developed in the House of Representatives concerning statistics education in cooperation with Representative Loebsack of Iowa. This bill will probably be not introduced until after the election and will probably be part of the reauthorization of the uh, <coughs> Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Although the content of the bill has not been finalized tentatively, it will provide funding for states with statistical literacy plans approved by the U.S. Secretary of Education. The American Statistical Association is working to promote the development of this bill and the eventual passage and implementation of it. Responding to the need for statistical education at this point would position Michigan to take advantage of the opportunities that would be offered by that bill. The Detroit chapter of the American Statistical Association would like to offer its services in promoting this effort. Bob and I are on that board. We're also on the board of the Detroit Area Council of Teachers of Mathematics, which also is interested in this. So we're here to offer our help and, and to make the suggestion about strengthening the, the STAT program. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And to whom should I give? I just wanted to mention that the Detroit uh, Teachers of Mathematics and the Detroit Tech 
so their, their society are having a joint conference November 13th at Lamper, it's at Lamper Schools, I yes, believe? Yes, Lamper High yeah. School. Mm -hmm. So and people he, might keep their ears open a week. And Elizabeth's on one of the panels. <laughs> <laughs> Well. <laughs> By the way, congratulations on your uh, recommendation. You're you got you're going to be nominated, right? Re yeah, mm -hmm. I am. Very good. I'm, I'm running hard. And <laughs> there are a lot of candidates in the room. There's a Lupe Ramos Montini back there as a candidate, mm -hmm. and I don't see Mary Wood. But anyway, there's a bunch. Yep. Thank you. Good luck. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Good. Our next speaker is Mary Dion Smith. Representing the Michigan Parent Teacher Student Association. Thank you. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk to you about PTA. I think of PTA as the ultimate parent resource. PTA supports parents as they raise children and provides a wealth of information to families. The Michigan Parent Teacher Student Association is planning parent and family education workshops across the state this year. We will hold programs in Grand Rapids, Lansing, Flint, and Detroit. Although we are still developing our program, we will be having sessions of interest to parents, including parents' rights and responsibilities in school and abstinence and sexuality education. And we're also working on um, a segment on early literacy and the parents' involvement in that. We plan to reach parents and family members in many communities, including PTA and non-PTA schools, and we will keep you informed of the program's details as we firm those up. As you know, PTA is a strong supporter of family engagement in our nation's schools. Research has shown that when families are involved in their children's education, there is improved attendance, increased student achievement, and a reduced dropout rate. Meaningful family engagement must be a key component of all school improvement efforts. Parents and families truly are the key stakeholders in education, and parents must be considered partners with schools in the education of their children. In discussions regarding school improvement, parents must be a part of this process. National PTA standards for family school partnerships focus on what parents, schools, and communities can do together to support student achievement. I've brought you uh, national PTAs, there are six standards in this. The Michigan PTSA encourages our PTA units and all schools to consider these six standards in their efforts to support family engagement. This partnership must be strengthened for all students to reach their full potential. The Michigan PTSA is working this year to promote the six standards as a means to strengthen family school partnerships. We know you support parental involvement in our schools and we trust we have your support of our efforts. We welcome your involvement in promoting stronger family school relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Becky Rocco, representing Calhoun ISD. Good afternoon. Hi. No. I've already provided a handout, so you have those. Um, I'm going to just paraphrase my remarks. Um, in the last several years, about five years, school districts have had declining resources both financial and human resources. So their capacity is, an all, is at an all-time low. Um, because we had some financial language, I'm going to give you the accountability language that schools deal with. We have CNA, NCA, SIG, CIMS, AER, RTTT, and PES. Those are some of the accountability structures that schools are um, trying to be compliant with. Um, the present MISAS that's before the board, um, we believe is premature. 
the reauthorization of ESEA will occur, we hope, sometime in the near future and may radically change how schools accountability structures are formulated at the federal level and may in fact have different directives to states in terms of their own state accountability systems. In addition to that, much like um, Dr. Pritchard said, we believe that schools in all fairness need to be judged on multiple measures, notwithstanding what's in the statute that she quoted, the um, uh, school accreditation statute, 3801280. Um, school districts often have many things going on in terms of meaningful school reform that is not measured in a year-to-year -year growth and certainly not measured in a two- to three-year growth measure. Um, and if we focus solely on um, performance, proficiency, um, what gets measured gets done. And we have schools who are making tremendous strides to do the right things, to select the right leadership, um, to have the right professional development in place, to do coaching and other meaningful reforms. And it will take them time for that. And while you do allow in the proposed accreditation system recognition for incremental growth measures, it is not the measure upon which you would deem accreditation for a school building or for a school district. So you either equally um, reward or punish school districts where they are in terms of proficiency and not digging down deeper to the systemic reforms that those schools, in fact, are, are trying to implement so that they do raise all the children's proficiency levels for um, all the grades and for um, all the staff. So we really encourage the State Board to take um, a more uh, thoughtful approach, um, to spend time looking at what the reauthorization may yield in terms of reforms and or direction for states. Um, and we stand ready to, to assist the department in any way that we can. Um, our position paper is on behalf of Barry Branch and Calhoun Intermediate School District Superintendents who I represent. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Thank Becky. Our next speaker is Sharon Gooding, uh, here representing State Representative Fred Durhall, Jr., <coughs> and she resides in Harper Woods. My name is Roy Godwin. I'm with Sharon, so uh, if we could speak together, that would be Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Sharon Gooding. I'm a uh, legislative assistant to State Representative Fred Durhall, Jr., 6th District, Detroit. And I'm here in support of public education and um, special needs education for our children. And I just wanted to present myself and introduce myself to all of you and also to let you know I will be attending future meetings. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. My name is Roy Godwin. I'm uh, the president of Detroit Council of Neighborhoods Association. And what I'm here for is to ask you to pass a resolution and make a statement supporting uh, our school board, our elected school board, and our uh, in our public school system. Uh, we've had a lot of problems as of late. Uh, our security force that was there for many years, about 30 years, has been replaced with an outside contractor. And since that outside contractor, we've had numerous shootings on the first day of schools because the schools that was closed, our kids are sent to schools aren't even told what schools they can go to. But however, there are no schools in those neighborhoods, so they're shipped into other neighborhoods. And you have rival gangs mixed up with one another. You have security forces that is not, not understanding of these kids. The, the uh, previous security force, they had built a relationship with these kids so they could pull them aside and talk to them and they could intervene. This security force cannot even intervene. You know, so therefore, you just got a free-for-all out there. And um, even taking the Hispanic community down in southwest Detroit, um, they only had two bilingual officers. Now those officers have been released. 
and they've been replaced with this outside force bilingual officer. And the kids won't come to them because most of these kids are parent, who have parents are from other countries and they don't speak any English and they do not trust authority. So it takes a long time for these people to build a relationship with these people. All right. And in addition to that, uh, one of our school board members at the last school board meeting last week, Elena Harada, said she went into a classroom and not a classroom, but the auditorium. And the kids jokingly said, are oh, you Miss Vac Vacancy? Because these kids, when they close these schools, they don't have enough teachers for them. So they're sit into an auditorium waiting for school assignment. Now, it's been, a, it's been over a week, and these kids are still sitting. So some of them are consequently leaving the school system. Nobody knows where they go because nobody keeps count or track, or, you know, or track of them. So what we're asking for is for your support, not, you know, even if it's just symbolic, your support in public education, supporting us in public education, supporting our elected school board. We passed a half a billion dollar millage in the last election, and we're still in debt. As a matter of fact, our deficit is rising, and that's unacceptable. We've always supported our children. In 94, I, I remember voting for a millage for $1.5 billion. But the state and the government decided that 2000 that they was going to come and take that money, and we had a $250 million surplus in our school system, and they took the money, and then they give it back to us, $250 million in debt. Now we have a half a billion dollars, and we don't know where it is. So symbolically, it would make a big difference if you would just say we support your elected school board. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for taking the time to speak before the board. Appreciate it. Um, if we can go back to C, uh, which would be the approval of minutes of the regular committee of the whole meeting of August 10th. Um, is there a motion, please? So moved. Supported by Reggie, supported by Nancy. Any direction, changes? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Thank you. Approval of the record of the retreat of August 25th, which is a very good one. Um, I move support. Moved by Liz. Supported support. by Carolyn. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. Um, Mr. Strauss obviously isn't with us today, but I'm sure we'll bring us up to date at the next meeting. Um, I, I, speaking of the retreat, I just want to thank the board. I think when we debriefed as a staff, we really were impressed with the effort that day and uh, the conversation, the dialogue, the, the, as well as the goals and objectives that we'll approve uh, later. I thought it was a great meeting. Cyber schools I was going to talk about, but I worked it into the earlier piece. Proficiency 90-90-90 reference group. I guess I worked that in earlier, too, <laughs> when it was more in context. That's the reference group that we've established to work that out. Um, dropout Summit. Boy, uh, what a nice experience. I, it's one of those things that you get on a calendar, and I just didn't get it fully till I got there. Uh, our guys have done just a tremendous job, and the 1,500 schools that have signed up for the, for the Dropout Challenge have really shown results. And um, it, it ties very much into our intervention uh, uh, presentations today in many respects. This is where, uh, remember, when we presented this, a lot of this was so that folks don't think of that as just a high school problem, that they understand you can identify kids very early. And I just can't thank the schools enough that have taken this seriously. They identify kids at, in elementary, middle, and high school, and then work to make sure that they're dealing with their issues before uh, dropout becomes almost inevitable. Um, our partners at MAISA uh, co-sponsored this with us, so uh, Myra and Shannon and Mandy and others who worked on that. And then in-house, uh, Lisa Gallagher, Jan Ellis, Sam, you know, wonderful job. I don't know if they're here right now, but really, it's really going to make a difference. It's one of those things that almost sounds sing-songy, but I can just, I felt very 
impressed and comfortable leaving that summit that you really had action beyond the paper when you could see people in the audience. This was down in the Great Dearborn area where the conference was held. And very good event. Sally and I uh, spoke at the Sandbox uh, Convention, I guess it was called, Sandbox Convention, which, as she said earlier, Sally's chair of the ECIC. And we had a chance, along with the two gubernatorial candidates, to address the crowd at Breslin. And uh, this is on uh, early childhood in the broad sense. It was really a neat event. I did pretty quickly, uh, Marty's always helpful to help me I usually put some thoughts down that I want to speak to, and then Marty sometimes helps with filling in pieces. And uh, I realized that the thousand kids or so sitting in front of us were not going to be listening to this <laughs> <laughs> fuddy duddy speech yeah. here. And I was surprised that the, frankly, some of the candidates didn't get that. <laughs> um, but I quickly threw that out and just basically thanked them for being there and, you know, good job. Tried to do a little bit on a more, you know, yeah. not as good as the president does it, but trying to give them a little bit of a pep talk. <laughs> but, yeah, once we realized we had that a little different. videos? We did, you know, I had my granddaughter up on the Breslin Center, yeah. up on the uh, Jumbotron. Oh. So that went pretty well, just to show that picture and make a point about that you've heard me make before about that. But. Uh, it really was a nice event, and I think it I think it really is a nice way to capture both R's and D's under a similar uh, kind of banner to say this is important for our, our state to succeed. I couldn't make the UP Summit last Friday, but I did do a live webcast from here, and it's, it's really a nice thing that Mike and others have set up here that gives us this fluidity to be able to not have to, you know, drive eight hours but still feel like you're in pretty close contacts, particularly when a representative at the end of the meeting kind of chastised me. It felt like I really was there, <laughs> um, unfortunately. <laughs> but I think we handled it okay, and I, I think we, uh, we, we <coughs> and then we received notification last night that Michigan's application for the education jobs funding was approved, so I think uh, reasonably soon those the funds will start to flow to uh, districts. It's another example, though, where I, this doesn't just happen automatically. I mean, um, the governor signs this and requests a, which of the two ways to go, and she, she chose the more broad distribution rather than the title distribution. I, I think that was in concert with negotiations with the legislature. Um, but what I think happens is, just like a lot of other things that you might have seen in the reform presentation today, that there's a lot of work at the ground level, and our guys are... <laughs> you know, kind of under the gun again to get the money out. And um, so it's always good news to get new money. It's always a challenge to make sure we have the mechanisms in place to get out. And Carol and her leadership on that are always very appreciated. Matinga. Matinga, your, your opportunity to report and welcome. We're so glad you're here with us. Thank you so much. Uh, this is an incredible privilege, and I hope I don't break anything, like I told uh, Jean today. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I uh, wanted to take an opportunity to just um, uh, speak about some of the things that I've s I saw so far this summer, and as well as some of the things that I see and as a teacher, mm -hmm. and also some of the things that I hope that we can uh, keep in mind as a body of uh, an educational body when it comes to implementing some of the really, really cool things that I've heard today. And um, if you uh, read my last report, I wanted to make sure to report on the fact that many teachers these days are, you know, taking their own time to learn and become more proficient at their craft. However, there is this, uh, you know, teachers who do this uh, exist in a vacuum. And there's this disconnect between the teachers that go out and uh, um, learn and, be and individually become uh, better teachers. And uh, when they come back to the schools, there's very rarely a platform mm -hmm. for these teachers to then share and deliver their knowledge. And so I wanted to uh, also share about an experience that I wrote about for, my, for this week's report. And I wanted to uh, talk briefly about some of those points that I, uh, I wrote about. And um, this idea that uh, it's time for 
teachers uh, to have a completely different dialogue, or at least a new dialogue, about the kind of things that we're doing individually as teachers as well as as a school. And uh, very often in staff meetings or in uh, professional development, we are always stuck, stuck speaking about the same things. We talk a lot about the, the data. We talk a lot about uh, the, the vision. But rarely do we have a conversation, a really difficult conversation, about the learning plan and what really happens in the classroom. Rarely do we have a chance to sit in each other's, uh, in each other's classroom to critique, at least in the high school level, that's a word mm -hmm. that we don't use very often. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to me, all of the incredible demonstrations that we've seen today um, are great ideas that sometimes I think are falling onto um, you know, unprepared soil, uh, simply because as teachers we don't have the, the platform to, to really consume that. So I went to a professional development run by M MDE that I thought was, that had a formula that I think that um, uh, uh, was very respectful to teachers as well as it provided a really good way to help us really become part of the vision. And one of the things that, uh, among many things, uh, that you know, we were allowed for the f to not only learn from professionals who are practitioners of the philosophy that was trying that we were trying to learn, but we were allowed to practice. We were allowed to listen to each other. We were allowed to critique. It was almost like science fair, and it was a two-week process. So it wasn't just an hour process. Mm -hmm. And you know, if really we are talking about a paradigm shift, mm -hmm. it is very important that we take into consideration that just delivering it in the same way uh, may, may not necessarily make the paradigm shift in the classroom. And sometimes I, you know, I'm a terrible baker. You know, I love to cook, but I can't bake because I don't like to measure. And so, <laughs> 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 that looks like a lot of cup, you know. <laughs> and, so, and so I always, you know, I, it reminded me of, you know, you're baking a cake and you have really good, fresh, inexpensive ingredients you put them in the bowl, and then you throw the bowl in the uh, oven, and then you expect people to consume that. And the process of maybe whisking that egg and you know fluffing that particular egg white and folding the cream sometimes is forgotten in the education process. And so I saw that in action, and I walked away so incredibly um, touched because you can teach. Uh, new tricks to old dogs. <laughs> 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 you know, and I walked away with um, the feeling that, you know, with all of these new ideas, or I don't think, I mean, a lot of the times they're not really new ideas, there's always really good ideas. Um, instead of asking ourselves the question, is this going to work? Are the teachers going to buy this? Maybe the question needs to be, uh, you know, under what conditions? are all of these ideas going to take root? Or under, under what conditions are our teachers going to buy this? And I hope that um, with these incredible ideas, and like uh, Mike mentioned, you know, with this incredible responsibility, and it, 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 is, it, it is so tact it's, it's so it's so palpable that when I went to school, the first day of school this year, it was incredible the feeling and the morale boost that the, the, the teachers had. Last June, it was a different concept. A lot of us were facing closing schools. A lot of us were facing you know, peers that we had bumped off mm -hmm. so that we could keep our jobs. And it was very, very difficult. Yet, we came back in the summer, uh, from the summer vacation, so pumped and so ready. And there's just a different note, and I'm not sh sure if it's, if it's some kind of coincidence, but it just seems like it's the right time, and providing a respectful way for teachers to learn your vision, I think, um, will be very beneficial for everyone. And so I wanted to share that with you today, and um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thank you nice, uh, nice YouTube uh, yeah. presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see why Tenga's Teacher of the Year. Yeah. Yes, I'd just like to say something because I think you have hit on something that's so important mm -hmm. about participatory learning, about uh, supporting uh, educators to become more educated and 
and it's something I talked I've talked about for a lot of long time that in our state I don't think we've ever given enough attention or resources to professional learning you know we get the educator we get them in the classroom we say go get CEUs or right. whatever right. but we haven't created a, a, a context a culture that that engages people in, in their own learning and I but my son teaches in a district in Colorado, and there all the teachers are engaged in action research in their classrooms. And then they have these periodic conferences where all the educators come and educate their peers, and it's like this huge celebration that goes on. And they, you know, and I've been to some of their uh, presentations on English language learners or whatever that I want to learn about. But there's such an excitement, but it, it's fostered, it's, it's supported. It isn't, you know, that they're it not is. having to do it on their own. Or, yeah, it is, yeah, and it's just as simple as providing that it's, structure. I'd love to that, work that with you structure. and our colleagues to get a louder voice for professional learning um, in our state. Yeah. Best time to do stuff is when everything's at sixes and sevens mm -hmm. from top to bottom is when you can create the best change. So. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so, so, so a lot of the time, it's not like we don't want to learn no. new stuff. It's just there's not. We it, don't have the platform. We don't have the scaffolding. Yeah. We don't have. Uh, you know, like I said, most of us go out and get. No, stuff I know, and people do it on their own. But what I want to see happen is that the state, that the people of Michigan, embrace mm -hmm. the learning of their educators, so that they. It's like we have two energized folks that can <laughs> help us fulfill that vision. Thank you for really yeah, I just, it's, it's, it's so important for, for uh, to keep you going. Over to the discussion action items, and the first one is the approval of the State Board of Ed, Michigan Department of Ed goals and priorities for 2010 and 11. And, um, these are presented in here. These were uh, discussed at great length in our retreat. Um, a motion for discussion and then moved. moved by Cassandra. Support. Supported by Nancy. Now I wanted to, yes. uh, I don't know if this is the right time, but I wanted to remove uh, Jay from discussion okay, or table it. We, we will get it off, but okay. we'll go by. <laughs> oh, that's why I said I don't know. No, I don't know either. I'm listening to the boss over here to the right, oh, and she's okay. telling me to. <laughs> she's nudging me under the table here. Oh, well, I didn't get a nudge. <laughs> you didn't. So um, no. thank you again for that retreat. I think we've done a good job together, I think, if I say so. No, no. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you very much. And now. Okay. This is a request. So do we take a vote? Um, or just item J? Mm -hmm. Yes. Joe? Yes. Joe, yeah. What, what's involved? terms of uh, Well, if Roberts. there's consensus to do that, we can do that by consensus. If there, if there's disagreement, then we probably should put it to a vote. Well, if, uh, then in, in that case, I'd rather uh, table it. We don't need a vote. Uh, I don't think you can table, table it, though. <laughs> I think you either need to remove it from the agenda or there has to be a motion regarding that item and then table the motion. Well, you know, I, I think... Um, I talked to Kathleen last night, and she had wanted to <coughs> do it, and uh, she was sick today, so. It needs more work. It does. I think so. I think it needs more work, too. Okay. So well, it looks like there's a consensus. Well, why don't we move it, and then we'll vote it down? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I don't know whether that, some folks had the same thought, thought as, uh, really as I did about it. I mean, I'm not sure what, what work it needs, but one, one thing. Um, that I uh, thought was missing was um, some tie-in with um, um, our earlier call with respect to all school districts mm -hmm. and um, the need for the state to um, provide adequate resources um, along with the calls for efficiency and effectiveness and strong academic plans. Um, and I thought we had, I thought that it was in an earlier draft. 
Well, does it sound like there is some consensus to just remove it for yeah, today, and then we'll maybe look, it, yeah. uh, ask Eileen to try to, as she has, yeah. you know, and by the way, I mean, I know you're not saying this, but Eileen did a great job on bringing points back and forth oh, from yeah. different yeah. board oh, members. Yeah. But no, oh, no, that's I, not the issue. Um, I, I think I just missed the last draft. It's I, my, I take too. responsibility yeah. for that. No, we'll, we'll, but we'll coordinate it again, and then we'll, yeah. for now, tentatively put it back on the next agenda, I guess, in a yeah. reconstructed yeah. form. Flying fast and furious. Yeah, no, Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, Fine. thank Sounds you. Sounds like there's consensus, so we can just move on, right? Good. So we're at K. Uh, and K is the uh, approval to abolish the Professional Standards Commission for teachers. I, the word so abolish is a little strong, by the way. It's, really <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's technically correct, but it's to, a lot we of love those the same. people, but it's right. the commission. It's so Eliminate. Right. But a lot of it is retiring the commission because yeah. a lot of those folks will be asked to be part of specific ad hoc sure. committees oh, that yeah. the board will ask for. So and, and they understand Just that. that. Entity. Uh, I move. Uh, Approval of item K. Support. Moved by Liz, supported by Nancy. Any further discussion? We're just here in case you've got questions. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I didn't want you if you had some prepared remarks. <laughs> Thank I you, Nancy. Want. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Okay. I didn't How about that? that for us? <laughs> well, the easiest <laughs> item. <laughs> All I wanted to do was just say I hope that we can can, can offer our thanks and um, yes. we have. to um, everyone that was on there because they worked hard at it and they really tried to provide leadership for us and did in many ways and uh, <laughs> it's just time to move on. Yeah, that's very good. Yes, well I stated. Think. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Okay, thank you very much. L is L stands for Lisa in my little alphabet book. We need a logo. I'm getting more into this as the new grandpa again, buying these stupid little books that I guess I should well, that, that's probably not a good way to <laughs> I'm buying them so they can't be uh <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, if I'm buying them, I think you it's a good thing. <laughs> That's a very good thing for children to be read to from right. the <laughs> age appropriate materials, right? We'll give you right? a couple minutes to take your foot out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Open my mouth and switch feet, as they say. <laughs> Ella, if you're out there, honey, I'll be reading to you Saturday. This will be on YouTube. Those little books <laughs> we sell at Borders. Yeah. Those little books we sell at Borders. <laughs> Those nice little books, thank yeah. you. Lisa. Uh, Lisa, please, <laughs> quickly. <laughs> Save them, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. uh, the budget. As of this morning, uh, the MDE department budget was um, reported from the conference committee. So that is a huge step forward for us. This is great news. Um, Rick Floria, who I don't think is here right now, but he worked uh, tremendously on this thing mm -hmm. and um, he and I both met with legislators and we were able to get a lot of um, changes that that weren't so positive for us taken out and some good stuff put in I had um, got a copy of a highlights document of it that I haven't even read yet that I forwarded to Eileen and I believe she's forwarded out to you so we'll probably be reading it at the same time mm -hmm. tonight I would bet yeah. um, <laughs> But, uh, but that did come out of conference. I expect that it will move on the floor either, um, it'll probably move on the Senate floor this week and the House floor next week. Um, all that's left is obviously them voting to adopt, uh, to concur on the conference report. Um, beyond that, in terms of state legislation, the focus right now in both chambers is on the budget and on any b bills that relate to the budget. So they're not taking up much other policy pieces right now. They're, they're mostly focusing on um, the pieces that were part of the budget deal. I think there was a tax amnesty proposal and uh, some of those other pieces. The other big piece that happened, I think, since the last time we talked was the shift of $200 million in school aid to uh, be used for higher ed, community colleges specifically. Um, that was the only other, and that was uh, a part of the whole budget agreement and was one of the first pieces that was moved. I think it was a tough vote for the legislators and they wanted to get that one over with relatively quickly just because of the politics and, and because I think it was a <coughs> tough choice for them to make uh, given the budget crunch that we're in. 
Um, the, I think you already mentioned, we just got notice yesterday that the $318 million in the Education Jobs Fund, the application was accepted and the money is being awarded. Um, so at the federal level, that was the big news of the last month has been completely on um, the focus on Education Jobs Fund and how the funding can be spent. There's been some um, conference calls between US Ed and our staff uh, to find out some of the particulars of you know, um, our job in terms of monitoring and oversight and that kind of thing. Um, beyond that, there's not a lot going on in D.C. on education specific other than, of course, the President's welcome back to school piece. Uh, those are the only updates I have from the written report that I provided. Any questions or comments from board? The only one I might add is uh, even though it's not a done deal yet, it's part of the the perceived budget deal that the governor has with the leadership so has a good chance I think of becoming reality and that's the retirement incentive. Uh, I'd be happy for my colleagues who would get a little bump on that um, but I, I need to tell you that it, it's uh, um, worrisome. I mean we are we are we have the highest uh, average age in this department and when you start looking at the potential impact mm -hmm. And then particularly if it gets to a point, which I don't know to be true or not, but last time it had to do with you couldn't replace every position when there was a retirement. So, you know, we're in for another challenge, perhaps. Um, I think likely. I would say likely. And uh, we'll probably have more to report the next meeting on that. You know, it's just, uh, but we're, what we're doing in-house is starting to get ready because, for example, it could be that a window would be between now and the next meeting if it were agreed upon. Mm -hmm. And then if there was a window of declaration between then and then, there'd be potentially a couple of dates to enact that. Um, to get the money savings that's attributed to that, it would have to be relatively early. So what I'm getting at is <laughs> without knowing, number one, has it been done? Mm -hmm. Number two, when it is done, how many of our folks would take advantage of it? And number three, that it might be in the very near future that it would be implemented. Mm -hmm. We've got to gear up to be ready to rehire those we'd be permitted to rehire mm -hmm. you know, after we get over the shock of not being able to rehire some because that's where the savings is going to be on this. The savings is mm -hmm. going to be in not replacing everyone who leaves. In addition to that, we're going to, if this deal goes through, and I think it would, is, is looks like there's going to be a 3% cut, we're going to have to, in addition to the other stuff we've done, mm -hmm. go back to the drawing boards and find another three. So, you know, we'll have a busy month and, and I think it'll, uh, we'll report back by then. I, my gut is if this <coughs> is going to happen, it'll all be before the next meeting and then, but we're going to start working right now. Today we're going to uh, meet on this later today to start to get ready that if it were to happen, where are the likely spots? You know, we can't determine for people whether they take them, but we can at least identify, we actually have already identified the, the candidates that would be eligible. And if you saw the, the, at least the press on this deal, it's, it's not only for the people who are eligible, traditionally eligible, but it's also eligible for folks that have that 80 factor age plus service. So theoretically you could be 70 with 10 years of service. And uh, there'd be a factor in there that would encourage, you know. If they get to 65, I'm, I'm just 65, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll yeah. see. And, uh, but, but anyway, we're, yeah. the juices are moving a little bit. And Time on <coughs> change. That, that, just a little addition on that. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And um, M is the approval of Michigan's position on proposed NASB bylaw changes public policy positions and election of officers. Over to Nancy Danhoff, our delegate. Well, we have um, before us that uh, we'll be at our October 15th uh, meeting, uh, national meeting in the National State Boards of Education. Uh, four different, um, uh, four different uh, public positions that we need to take action. Well, actually before that, I, said, I suppose I ought to do the bylaws changes. Bylaws changes that are being proposed this year by NASB are rather um, inconsequential at, at best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the first proposal is that uh, two or more unexcused absences be a, by a member of the board of directors will result in the position being declared vacant. And the reason for that is that there's only four meetings in the year, and if you're gone for 50% of them, chances are not only you haven't <laughs> been very uh, 
very involved, but you probably inhibited the work of, of the board itself, and so they felt that that was worthwhile, and I, I would not disagree with that. The other is a matter of process because a new position has been added. On the board there exists eight uh, members consisting of four junior area directors and um, uh, they've added one more, the senior new member representative. Um, what we have is if for new board members state, uh, in the states, there is a new rep member representative that kind of helps them get used to working with uh, state other states and with the uh, national board and how they can function and where they can be effective. And they found that they needed someone that they could go to, kind of a go-to person that they then could talk and work with those who were just joining the, the fray with those of us who are part of the state boards of education. So in doing that, they wanted to make sure that person was part of board meetings and could be effective in that way. Both of those to me are rather innocuous. So I would ask whether or not this board would concur with those two bylaws changes. I support, I move we support the changes uh, to the NASB bylaws. Support. It's moved by Liz, supported by, by Carolyn. <laughs> by Mary Carolyn. <laughs> Mary Carolyn, I like that. His, his, his Catholic upbringing is showing. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion on that item? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. The one that's a little more uh, juicy uh, is are the proposals to their, what they call their public education positions um, that they take. And they do this with the idea that, that uh, just as in the common core standards that state boards can also agree on public positions in education. Three of them uh, that they're proposing kind of mimic exactly what we're doing here, so I don't have any problem with them whatsoever, but there's one that we might want to take a look at. But, um, for the reasons of going through the three that I think will are not going to be a problem, the one is on balanced data uh, systems of assessment and accountability. It almost is like reading the notes from our morning presentation, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Uh, they talk about state assessment systems that should be based on definition of learning in terms of clear, succinct, and high standards that identify what students need to know and do to be college and career ready. Therefore, all states should and they talk about have assessment systems that are designed to improve student, student learning, noting that not just one single assessment, but that ongoing summative, formative, and what are the other, it's got a, an interim. They look at interim assessments as well, should need to be part of the assessment system. Mm -hmm. That the frequently evaluate, we should frequently evaluate assessments to ensure validity, reliability, and fairness, and to determine their impact on student and teacher learning shift more attention to classroom-based assessments that permit a finer grain analysis of student understanding through the use of a variety of performance-based tasks, ensure that teachers have the tools and training they need to strengthen the connection between assessment and instruction. That's something I've really pushed for some time in our, in our teacher preparation programs that we can't wait for a master's degree to learn enough about assessment to yeah. understand how to use it as a formative assessment, assessment on a daily basis or an interim assessment. Uh, provide assessment results with user-friendly transparent information that clearly describes results and differences in learning in a subject area in order to communicate effectively about student performance. Develop appropriate assessments and accommodations for special education students and English language learners through extensive research and testing to ensure they are of high quality, technical quality, they pro should provide for a range of options, um, emphasis on universal design, the development of high quality accommodations policies, and provisions of alternate assessments that adhere to professional testing standards and support high achievement levels. Uh, they should take advantage of the enormous possibilities offered through technical and technology and its applications to integrate assessment and classroom teaching towards specific learning goals. Technology can contribute to powerful learning environments by embedding well-designed formative assessment strategies using highly engaging and innovative approaches consistent with how students learn. My recommendation is that we concur with this. I, I think this mimics exactly what we're doing in Michigan and mm -hmm. barring any staff member that tells me I missed something, um, I think that's something that we've done uh, quite well here. So move. Yeah. Support. 
All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The, uh, the, another one is school improvement, principles for instructional materials in a digital age. And this is what they talk about, which we have done it with our technology um, standards in the state, mm -hmm. about what needs to take place to have good instructional materials available to our students. And they have several um, key points that need to be, they believe, need to be um, part of that. That, that the, they allow for flexible use and control over con content by users to meet a range of instructional approaches and modalities and the individualized needs of all students, including access by students with disabilities. I know that's something we've really worked hard on. They are closely aligned with state standards for what students should know and be able to do uh, and with the state accountability system. They are accessible on demand at a time and place of learning, whether in or out of school. Gets mm -hmm. rid of our seat time mm -hmm. situation. They are cost effective and represent good value for the investment of public dollars. They address the needs of teacher training on using mm -hmm. the materials. They are vetted by subject matter experts and educators. They are updated frequently to reflect new developments. They engage learners with through multiple media and they are able to be supported by or grow from voluntary collaborative interstate efforts. States should consider copyright liability and other legal issues in the adoption of instructional materials. I think that kind of summarizes our state standards on technology mm -hmm. use in the classroom. So mm -hmm. again, I would recommend that we that we support that. So move. Support. Okay, there's a motion and a support. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed nay. Motion carried. Okay, and the last one that I would recommend is the family and community school community partnerships. State boards of education should leverage their leadership and policy making roles to promote the importance of school community partnerships as part of comprehensive education and dropout prevention plans. State boards can do this by a creating a communication plan to inform students, parents, and stakeholders, Department of Education staff, districts, and schools on community and education issues and how each of these individuals and entities can be involved, leading by example as they develop and facilitate partnerships as well as support local collaborations that connect state level policymakers to workforce development, higher education, families, and the community at large, promoting partnerships and dropout prevention initiatives by providing small grants to schools and districts or making sure currently available resources are allocated properly using their role as policymakers to examine current policies and ensuring they encourage support and sustain best practice models of school community partnerships and dropout prevention, creating a systemic comprehensive education framework around an inclusive vision for student success, developing a longitudinal comprehensive data system that includes students' academic, behavioral, and health data, is, available, is able to provide real-time information and can flag students who may need early intervention programs and services and creating multiple pathways to graduation and opportunities to gain and apply knowledge and skills that will require strategic school community partnerships. I think that was our morning presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I would again uh, recommend that we support this. Or uh, um, some of support. Oh, any further discussion? Thank you, Carolyn, for You're welcome. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Oh, same. And then we get to the sticky wicket. State account accountability should focus on how the system, including school, district, and state levels, performs in a number of key areas. And two, make use of multiple indicators of which summative assessment is only one. States should collect qualitative and quantitative measures, including student growth over time across the entire achievement continuum, as well as other indicators of school progress. The accountability index or composite should include long-term data that measures whether or not students have been effectively prepared for college or the workplace, including graduation data, college or workplace entry, and college completion. To ensure that the assessment systems achieve their purposes, states must establish standards for teacher and leader competencies regarding their knowledge and skills of how student learn, students learn, how learning can be assessed, and how these two must be closely integrated to guide classroom assessment and instruction. In addition, states must establish consistent teacher development standards that position assessment literacy as a major component for teacher licensure 
accreditation for preparation programs and teacher evaluations. States must also ensure that national faculty responsible for training teachers and leaders throughout the United States has the requisite training in the fundamentals of effective classroom assessment. That states must ensure that all levels of the system, classroom, school, and district, educators are providing with ongoing high quality professional development along with the guidance tools, infrastructure, and technology to improve educators' assessment literacy and their use of multiple assessments to measure student progress and respond to individual learning needs. State boards should consider the significant potential of growth and value-added assessment models when used in conjunction with other measures and supports as tools to improve teaching and learning, evaluate programs, and provide for effective equitable resources, resource allocations. However, states should be aware that value-added assessment is not designed for high-stakes use in teacher evaluations and that value-added assessments models, must, models need continued pilot testing, research, evaluation, and validation. While on the, on the face of this, I, I think we can agree with most of this, I'm not sure that this first part that, that says summative assessments aren't um, pretty much what we look at for accreditation based on our discussion with MISAS, I guess what I'd like to know is where the, what the board feels about this. Is this something we can support? Is it contradictory to what we've already passed? Mm -hmm. That's a quandary that I've fallen into. Thoughts on the quandary? <laughs> <laughs> I could support it. So you don't think it puts us at, a, at cross purposes with what this, our state has already passed? We haven't actually passed uh, my Oh, excuse staff. me. I shouldn't say that. What we have been recommended. Right. So then that, that opens up the discussion yeah. then for our recommendation then. There's some other recommendations in front of us from the districts too. Yeah, I mean, it, it, exactly. We haven't passed it yet. And okay. we're going to even look at some of the comments that were made today as we always do. And there may be some issues that we would even bring back for further okay. thought. But one way or the other, it's up for, is it the next? Scheduled for October. For October. So is there a motion then? I'll, I'll move. Support. Oh, a motion and support. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot. I lost track of who's in charge here now. On that, that section of the bylaw. Uh, all, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. So, okay. Last but not least, we are voting for officers. There is only one person currently running for president elect. We know. Oh. Uh, yes, and that's yeah, Gail Manchin, oh, West I was Virginia. Thinking of John. No. Um, it would be nice if there were two people, but there aren't. Um, this is I will for say president this elect. is for president. Now, I'm not able to be there, um, and Carolyn will be there in my in my stead. Um, it is possible that someone can bring, uh, with with support of, uh, I think it's two other. You can bring an additional nomination, uh, written petition signed by the voting delegates of three or more states from the region eligible to vote to be received at headquarters. Um, you can bring it that day too, I believe, isn't it? That they, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm not quite sure what, if, if we want to take a vote that barring no other candidate, and then we'll leave it up to Carolyn if there is another candidate that day. Last, and the reason I say this is the last time there was. Um, they did bring somebody else that day. So, Could we say that we could do it jointly? I, I have to name one person, but oh. you, it's not going to prohibit oh. you guys from talking. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you're both okay. going to be at the thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, why don't we leave it to their discretion that they know our thinking and right. they can decide between them. and. Good. And if the new person is just superstar, but I would think if the superstar was there, that we would have been hearing, hearing about it. Well, I, I think the gal that's running is yeah. pretty well qualified as yeah. the first yeah. lady yeah. of yeah, so West, Virginia. West Virginia. I, I just didn't want she? to say yeah. something that she is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she is. She's the governor's wife. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's pretty high quality. Yeah. 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 And she's mm. really appointed by the governor. Too. Yeah. She's a good yeah. Oh, glad we're not. Doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that about the. Existing people, no, no, no. I just politics. It, it, I know, yeah. I agree. No, I'm pretty happy with the way we do things here. <laughs> I think we can just send them with the sense that we support Gail's okay. candidacy. And I just didn't want to put words in people's mouths. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they can have a 
Is that a motion, Liz? Yeah. Well, Spirit yeah, I guess I'll put in the form of motion that, uh, that we ask our delegate to support Gail's candidacy um, for president-elect of NASB. Uh, any support? Support. Support by Cassandra, by Liz. Further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Mm. Great. Thank and you. then last but not least, we have Central Area Director, of which Dave Dennis from Kansas is there, and I think you've probably all gotten a letter from Dave, yeah. and our own John Austin of Michigan. Maybe that's why he's not here today. Um, <laughs> he's in Washington. He hasn't even laughed us. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, he's yeah. Yeah. All, he sent out a letter. letter. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, we need to vote for no, one. He sent out a letter. We, got, we so got a lobby. That's a no-brainer. I know. <laughs> is this only voting for one? Yes. yes. Oh, I move that we ask our delegate to cast her vote for John Austin. Yes. Move by. The fine state of Michigan. Oh. <laughs> Great state of Michigan. Michigan. Liz, get, uh, any support? Support. Sorry. Move by Nancy. Yes. Further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. You had a big lot. Thank, Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. They kept sending us more mail all the time. All the time. <laughs> Uh, consent agenda. Are there any items the board wishes to remove? Item O has already been removed. Yeah. Let me look here. I, I move the we adopt the consent agenda mm -hmm. as presented. Support. As moved by Liz. Supported by Reggie. Nancy, a second there. Oh, is that it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. okay. I couldn't remember. That's what the. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. Any comments from board members? Do I need to do anything with all? Yeah. Mm -mm. Comments? Uh, yes, Liz. Just, just a, a quick thing. On um, sun, sun, Saturday evening, there was a, a fantastic gala in the southwest Detroit that was honoring Cindy Estrada. But they also, uh, the Hispanic um, oh, Borica, Chicana Borica Studies Program at Wayne State University is in its 39th year. It was celebrating the 39th year of this wonderful program that assists Hispanic uh, uh, Chicano students to succeed when they come to Wayne State, and it honored um, you know the new vice president of the United Auto Workers, Cindy Estrada, because she's a graduate of that program. But they also gave awards, and they gave the community service award to our very own Anna Cardona from the oh, um, really? Michigan oh. Department of Education. And it was just, I, I didn't know that was going to happen when I got there, and I ended up sitting with her, and it, was, it just felt really great to have our Congratulations, Anna. I'm not sure, are you watching? Or are you I said, I said, Anna, does, I said, does anyone back at the ranch know that you're getting this award? And she thought not. So very modest. <laughs> very, very, very excellent great, and very great modest. Work we'll make in, it a point in, that. Uh, arts education, and this is art. This is Art Week. It's got a, it's got a fancier name, but I can't. It's not coming to me right now. Anyway. She would not have brought that to our attention, so thank you for doing that. We'll we'll have the proper honor. She's too modest to tutor her yes. on tutoring. Other board members. Okay, our next meeting is October 12th at 9:30, and I guess we can consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. Okay, you may have